morning, everyone. Hey, I was up early this morning, about five o'clock this morning. I drove up from Colorado Springs. I'm running on zero coffee and a whole lot of Jesus. I just um, had a, the privilege and the honor to get to speak at a women's conference and um, had sessions Friday night and Saturday night, and God is doing a work in this state. I'm so excited to be here with all of you. I feel like your family already. Um, Pastor David has... Um, He's been part of the Forge family and is one of our Forge speakers. And so we got to help pray as you all were launching this church. And so, so excited to hear the move of God and what's happening here. I'm going to share a little bit about, uh, um, about my journey with the Lord. And I just want you to know that um, my husband is here with me. And we've been married for 27 years. We've got three kids. We're just now entering that empty nester stage. And I saw some cute babies running around and all these kids running around. I thought, oh, my heart is just leaping for all of you that are still in that family season because my heart hurts for being an empty nester right now. But God is good. He's so faithful. Uh, Sharing my testimony with you, I didn't give my life to Christ until I was 27 years old. I ran from God for 27 years. I didn't grow up in a Christian home, and I did everything I could to run from God. I started having my children. We were married, and there was something longing inside of me. I quit my job to stay home with the kids, and there was something missing. I didn't know what it was, so I tried to fill it with all this stuff, and before I knew it, I had nearly $30,000 worth of credit card debt just going to the store, trying to find something, trying to fix something. And I started, I said, we need to get our, we need to go to church. So we started going to church, just listening. We went to a small little church, wooden pews, stained glass in mid-Michigan, beautiful church, but we went to church and we checked the box on Sunday morning. And then we left and lived life as normal, looking no different than anybody else and went back to church the next Sunday. And I was in a MOPS group, Mothers of Preschoolers, and when I was in that group, there was a woman who kept inviting me to go to church. And I said, I don't want to go to your Bible study. I don't want to go. Like, I just had this preconceived notion of what it was going to look like, so I wanted no part of it. And she invited me again and again. And after three weeks, she said, what are you doing that you're so busy that you can't come to my Bible study? And I said, I'm folding laundry and I'm watching soap operas. She said, are you serious? You come to church next, you come to my Bible study next Friday. So I went and it was like there was this, this glass wall and this plexiglass that I was watching from the outside looking in as people were praising and worshiping the king. But something was missing. I sat in that Bible study and I listened and I sat down after and I said, what do you mean the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit? You can't be three people at one time. What do you mean that he was buried, he died, and he was resurrected? You can't be resurrected. And she started walking me through the scriptures. And she said, you're ready to give your life to Christ. And I said, no, I'm not. I walked out of that Bible study and I went home. And on our front porch happened to be a VHS Jesus video. And I put it in and watched it on the television. It was almost like that Star Wars, like the, the prayer of salvation was just was, was going up on the screen. And I read it, but I was like, I'm not ready for this. I went to church the next day on Sunday morning. We had a guest pastor. They never did altar calls. This guest pastor gets up after the worship team, which incredible. I couldn't have walked into a better worship set this morning. I had to write this down. If you're searching for a heart, that's your reward. I'm yours. God orchestrates every detail. So I'm sitting there and this pastor comes up to the stage and he said, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and I'm not going to start preaching this message because there's somebody here today that is ready to give their life to Christ. My heart started thumping within my chest. I knew he was talking about me. I turned to the right and I turned to the left. Nobody's moving. Same Sunday morning, silence just like this. And he said, I'll wait. My heart is leaping out of my chest, almost like one of those pullback matchbox cars that's ready to be let go. I jumped up. I couldn't get out to the right or left. I jumped up. This is no joke. Over the wooden pews, go forward two wooden pews, and I hop out and I run to the altar. And I said, God! I don't know you, 
but I promise to serve you all the days of my life. And I sat there on the altar for over two hours. The church service went, I don't even know what the pastor preached. But I sat there and I had a moment with God. That was 22 years ago. I walked back down the aisle. My husband went and grabbed our kids. All the lights were off at the church, but my pastor was in the back. And my pastor, as I walked out, I said, Pastor, I just met with God. He said, Melissa, it went from head knowledge to heart knowledge. You no longer know just about God. You know God. And let me tell you, when God gets a hold of your heart, you're never the same. You're never the same. And that was, that was my story 22 years ago. And the scripture says this in Genesis 2, 7, And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. When you get close enough to God, I'm telling you, something comes alive inside of you. And in John 20, 21, as Jesus is saying, peace to you as the father sent me, I also send you. And we said this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. We see it in the Old Testament in Genesis with God breathing into Adam. And we see it in the New Testament with Jesus breathing on his disciples. Receive the Holy Spirit. God changed my heart. And in that process and in that journey, my husband was a borderline alcoholic at the time. I grew up in a family where my father was an alcoholic at different seasons, and so I knew what that looked like. And I was reliving, and a cycle was happening again. Yet I had given my life to Christ, and so it looked different. And the Holy Spirit had spoke to me and he, because I started preaching to my husband. And he said, I don't need another mother. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit said, you just live it. Live it by lifestyle evangelism. And so for the next several months, I would try my best. I'd be praying for my husband and be on my knees for my husband. God was changing things inside of me. Things that were okay that I did before weren't okay anymore. This holy conviction because God was just so good and he met me. And he delivered me from so many things after 27 years. We go to a wedding and that night my husband was drunk and said some hurtful things, and I thought, I'm just going to go back to the hotel. So I go back to this little best Western hotel in Western Michigan by myself. I don't even know what time he came in. And the next morning, he wakes up, and it's like every, it's going to be like every other day. But it wasn't like every other day to me because I had made a decision. Even though I was a believer, I wanted to serve God with all my heart. I'm like, God, I can't do this like this. Being unequally yoked like this, I can't take it, I can't do it, and all I want to do, my heart just wants to serve you with everything I have. And my husband says, what time are we leaving? And I said, babe, today's not like any other day. I said, I can't do this anymore. And he said, Melissa, I've been watching you for the last six or seven months. And you've been transformed, and I want what you have. And on that little bed in the Best Western Hotel, he gave his life to Christ. And 22 years later, he's never been the same. And I got the privilege and the honor to watch my sister come to the Lord. My agnostic brother-in-law, my mother, my father, my mother-in-law and father-in-law, my sister-in-law one by one by one, give their life to Christ because of a radical change, because God got a hold of my heart. And one by one by one, God ended up getting a hold of their heart. They've never been the same. Fast forward 22 years, and here we are, and uh, I'm serving God. I've gotten the privilege and the honor to do some really cool things for God, travel around the world and, and help with so many incredible kingdom initiatives. I moved from Michigan to help plant a church here in the Denver area. 
But in the midst of the journey, I got so focused on the ministry that I lost sight of the master. And I heard about this thing called the Asbury Revival in February. At a little place in Wilmore, Kentucky, small university, just several thousand students. I think the town doesn't have more than three to 5,000 people in the town. There's basically a stoplight and a grocery store and I think a subway. And I heard about this thing called the Asbury Revival and something inside of me was like, I have to go. And I'm, then I'm, these thoughts of, well, that's, that's crazy. I can have a revival right here in my own house. But I knew that I needed to go. And suddenly text started coming in. That's the way God works sometimes. He'll just put, drop a seed in your heart. And then affirmations and confirmations might start coming from all different ways. And I said, Lord, should I go? And I felt like the Holy Spirit say, why wouldn't you want to experience my presence? Well, Lord, won't it be over? Like these revivals I've heard of haven't lasted forever, though my heart wants it to be everything within me to last forever. And God said, I'll wait for you. God waits for us. He's so kind and he's so good. He's wooing us and drawing us closer. He's faithful. I talked to my husband. He's like, go. So I booked a ticket for the next day, and I ended up um, going to, I was getting ready to go to the airport, and I was walking. I had my suitcase with me, and I grabbed the door of the garage, and I felt like the Holy Spirit dropped something in my heart. I heard the Holy Spirit say, not an audible voice. I heard with everything within me that said, stop. Turn around. Look. Look at your house. When you come back, you'll never be the same. And I don't think he was just talking about my physical house, but my spiritual house, this vessel. So I go and I, I called a friend and said, hey, why don't you meet me at the revival? And she said, I'll drive there. I'll meet you. So I get on the airplane and I get a text message and it said, the text message said, I'm so sorry. I, I can't come, but let me know if I need to hop in the car. Like if it's that great, I'll come. And my heart sunk. And I said, Lord, like I'm alone. Normally I travel with my husband every week and he's on the road for business. And I thought, I'm alone. And I felt like the Holy Spirit said, you've never been alone. You've never been alone. And I'm like, well, Lord, like she backed out on me. And the Holy Spirit said, I'm no stranger to people backing out on me. I'm no stranger to people backing. I get to Kentucky, get my rental car, drive into one in the morning and get into the, the hotel. And I'm just so ready and in fire to go. And I get in the car the next morning at like five o'clock in the morning. I'm starting to get text messages. I heard that the revival doesn't really start going to like two o'clock in the afternoon. And hey, maybe you just want to wait, get there around three. And every part of me is like, no, I'm going. So I hopped in that car at five in the morning and started driving another hour and a half to two hours to, uh, to the Asbury Revival at Wilmore. And as I'm driving, everything I see, hear, feel, touch, experience, everything, it was like the Holy Spirit was on overload and download. And I believe it's because I had a heart of expectation, asking for the Holy Spirit to move and say, God, I'm ready. If you want a heart, this heart is yours. So I'm driving down the road and I pass a semi of, with a paint can that's tipped over with a paintbrush that says, paint the world. And the Holy Spirit says, you paint the world for me. And I drive down, I see all these beautiful farms with all these horses that are all throughout Kentucky. And I see these bridal trails on the side. And I felt like the Holy Spirit says, you blaze a trail for me. I get to Wilmore, Kentucky, and I park over on the side, and I go to get out of the car, and I'm literally still sitting in the car, and I put my left foot out, and I feel the Holy Spirit says, you're standing on holy ground. That needs to be a revelation for us. Every place we put our foot is holy ground. I get out, and I'm, I'm, I'm angry with the Lord because I... I had asked the Lord, I'm at, I did all of this. Like, look what I did, God. I got on a plane. I set my schedule aside. I want to be inside that auditorium. But I got put in the overflow across the street. So I'm arguing with the Lord with my cocky little self. 
And I go and I sit down and there's just a few other people there waiting. And the worship starts up on a screen and I can see what's going on across the way. And the worship is going and I felt like the Holy Spirit's like, you get, you stand. And I looked around to my right and to my left. Nobody's standing, so I sat in my chair. I can worship from right here. And the Holy Spirit said, if you want others to take a stand for me, then you take a stand. Stood up, worshipped, ended up, after that session, going outside, and all of a sudden the line is like several thousand already um, from all, all different angles, and they're getting ready for the next session, and I thought, I'm going to try to get over into that main session. So I go, and I wait in line, and I was one of the last hundred people that made it into the main auditorium. I sat in that auditorium for 13 hours that felt like a minute. The Bible says that, a, that um, a thousand years are but a day and a day but a thousand years. It felt like an instant and 13 hours was over. The worship was so incredible. Hungry hearts from, at this point I was there on day seven, or, day seven and eight. It was a 16-day revival with over 50,000 people that came. Hungry hearts from around the world that were sitting there recklessly abandoned for God with a heart of anticipation for God to move. So hungry. I, I say that we were famished. Beyond thirst, beyond hungry, we were famished for more of God. And my husband, bless his heart, he's not a, he's not a words man. He can do all these amazing things with his hands. He can build houses, fix tractors, he can do it all. But like words of affirmation is really not his language. Well, that's my love language. And so sometimes I'll just text him, note to self, remind your bride how much you love her today. I'll just kind of help him out a little bit. And um, so I'll do that from time to time. Well, do you know when I got to the Asbury Revival and I had my Bible with me and I went and I sat down, worship is going. I mean, people are at, people, there's altars everywhere. People are turned around facing their seat. People are facing forward. The altar's filled. People are standing and praising. Worship everywhere. Someone had described it as the smell of tears. If you, could, if you could smell it, it was a smell of tears and the saltiness of tears. And I sat there and I heard the Holy Spirit say, baby girl, let me tell you how much I love you. I didn't have to send him a text. I didn't have to remind him. Let me tell you how much I love you. I didn't want to move that night. I ended up going back to, back to the hotel. Every part of me didn't want to, but it was the first night that they were actually going to conclude it for that night so that they said, even Jesus pulled back and rested. And they said, our worship teams need to rest. They had tons of worship teams. They said, our worship teams need to rest. We'll be back and we will start tomorrow morning. So I left and I got up the next morning and, and I felt like I was getting ready to go and I felt like the Holy Spirit said, don't you tarry. And I'm like, okay, Lord, well, I'm getting my stuff together. I'm going to put my makeup on. And he said, no need to put makeup on. You're going to cry holy tears today. And I'm, I, that, I took that seriously, grabbed all of my stuff. And, um, and I got in the car and I said, man, I hope I didn't leave anything behind. I left there so fast. And I felt the Holy Spirit say, I hope you left everything behind. Sometimes we can carry so much baggage with us. The Holy Spirit is so good. He's so good to us. And I remember the last, the second, uh, the second day I was there, like the last hour, I said, Lord, I don't want this to end. I don't want this to end. Like, outside of my salvation in day one, the best day of my life. Day two and three was at this Asbury Revival because I got to meet God in such a profound way again where my, my heart was ready to receive him and my ears were tuned in and my heart was praying, God, I need you. I need you. How desperate are you for Jesus? Because I'm telling you, we can sit in church and we can do great things in ministry. 
but we can lose sight of the master. We can lose sight of the master. He knows us. He's waiting for us. I want to share just a few scriptures out of the word of God of testimonies. I mean, that's just my testimony, my testimony of my salvation. And that's my testimony from the Asbury revival. And there's six pages of it. I don't even have time to get in it. All of what he did and what he said and what he promised and the faith that he instilled in me. I should have warned you. I cry all the time. I should have warned you to get your tissues out. There's, this book is filled with testimonies that we're reading thousands of years later. You have a testimony to share with others. I'm going to walk you through a few of these testimonies where God gripped people's hearts and they were never the same. Lydia, in Acts 16, Lydia see here. Acts 16, 13 through 15 is what I'm going to reference. And this is when Paul and Silas, they were going around and they were ministering and they were happened to, where are the people gathering to pray? It was kind of like a Sunday morning, just like this. People were gathering together to pray for a worship service. And it says, and on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made. And we sat down and we spoke to the women who met there. Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatara who worshiped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us saying, if you've judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. This is a woman, a seller of purple, who worshipped God. She was a worshiper. They went and they found her in the house of God. She's already a worshiper, but it says God opened her heart. Let me tell you, no matter where you're at in your journey with God, he can sit here and he can touch your heart and open it in new and profound ways where you will never be the same. Even beyond past that moment of your salvation, as we're journeying with the Lord, he continues over and over and over to relentlessly pursue us, to touch us so that we're never the same. I don't know about you, but I don't want to sit and be the same as I was yesterday. There's more of God to be had. That's just one. That's Lydia. What about Saul on the road to Damascus in Acts 9, 3 and 6 and 17 and 18? We all know the story of Saul. He's persecuting Christians. He's killing Christians. He's on the road to Damascus and he has an encounter with God. Verse 3, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I'm Jesus who you're persecuting. It's hard to kick against the goads. We drop over to verse 17, and Ananias went his way and entered the house, laying hands on him, and he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you had came has sent me that you may receive sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately they felt, there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight. Once he arose and he was baptized. So when he had received food, he was strengthened, and Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. At Damascus. In verse 9, I want to go back to, it says, and he, was, and he was three days without sight, neither ate nor drank. There was something so profound that happened on that road to Damascus when God met Saul that he's, Lord, who are you? How does he even say, Lord? He knew who he was, but he didn't know in his heart who he was. He didn't know him personally. Something so profound that he couldn't eat or drink for three days because he encountered the living God. God. 
God got a hold of Saul's heart on the road to Damascus. And 18. But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and she looked into the tomb and she saw two angels in white sitting one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus was laying. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, because you've taken away my Lord and I do not know where they've laid him. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, sir, if you've carried away, tell me where you've laid him and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned and said to him, Rabboni, which means teacher. He called Mary by name. Let me tell you, he is calling you by name. He's calling you by name, but are you in tune? He says, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. Are we following him? I'm I'm here to tell you there's days where I've heard the voice of God and I've been disobedient. Why have I been disobedient to the Lord that would lay down his life for me? He called her. He called her by her name. And she turned and said, Rabbi, I know you. You're my teacher. I'm going to follow you. It's just three instances of testimonies in the word of God, just like yours. Testimonies just like yours. We have, we won't turn there today. There's several more that I was going to reference for you. The eunuch, when he's reading in the chariot, he's reading out of Isaiah and he's not understanding and God sends Philip over to him to help him. And he says, how can I, how can I understand if someone doesn't walk me through it? And then he responds to that when Philip starts teaching him the word of God. And he says, why shouldn't I be baptized? And Philip says, if you believe with all your heart, if you believe with all your heart, there's the woman at the well Jesus is talking to her. She's having an encounter with with her at the well. And she says, I know when the Messiah comes. I know when Jesus comes, he'll lead us into all things. And Jesus said, I who speak to you am he. And it was such a profound moment in her life that changed her forever. She leaves her water pot and goes running into the city to tell the men, come and meet a man who's told me everything I've ever done. She had such an encounter that she had to go tell the world about a man that she just met. Have I ran to tell the world about this encounter that I had and how my heart has been changed? God, forgive me when times where I just pass by so many people that need the same love and grace and forgiveness that I have. We have to experience Jesus. Intimacy with God, it evokes a response within us. When you have met with the living God, the creator of your soul, I better be praising, worshiping, repenting. That's a word we don't want to use anymore, repentance. I believe one of the greatest opportunities that I had at the Asbury Revival was because I was, I, la- I sat there one day, I, the second day, I said, okay, Lord, I worshiped all day yesterday. I said, okay, Lord, I'm here. Do, do as you wish today. And I sat there and I knew the Holy Spirit wanted me to go to the altar. I knew he did. And you know what this cocky little girl said? Well, you can do business right here in this chair, Lord. 
And I said, I'm ready. The Holy Spirit said, you'll never be ready to see the fullness of your sin. I made my way to the altar, did business with the Lord on the altar at the Asbury Revival, and it felt like the Lord took my heart, and it felt like it went through a meat tenderizer, but with the most gracious, merciful, and loving hands. As I said, Lord, I don't even know what I don't know. Expose the hidden, the dark, the deep places, the crevices, the cracks that I don't know about. But God, it's yours. And he was so loving and so gracious and so merciful. God's waiting for us. I wanted to share this with you. My daughter just took a job recently. She gets to do some really cool stuff now. She's on tour around the world, around the country, helping with Christian artists artists and Christian bands like Carrie Job or Mercy Me and Bethel, all that fun stuff. And Mercy Me happened to be coming to Colorado Springs a couple months ago. And she said, hey, Mom, why don't you come on down? I'll give you a backstage pass and you can go to the concert. She said, come around, park in the back. So I did, and I walked in, and I entered, and I got this Mercy Me, Always Only Jesus Tour, All Access Pass. And she puts it around my neck. And I'm walking around the back, and I thought, well, I don't want to be that person who's carrying my phone around waiting for the next selfie, and, like, if I see anybody, I'm going to get this little picture. And I just thought, you know what? It's so awesome that I get to see her in her element. And I prayed over her and prayed over the opportunity, and I just walked down, and I sat in my seat. And worship started. And when worship started, the lights were dim just like this. And all I could do was remember that moment with the Asbury Revival. And I bowed down on my knees and I just began to worship. I worshiped as it's echoing throughout the stadium. And I looked down and I happened to just open my eyes and I see all access. And the Holy Spirit deposited in my heart, Melissa, you have an all access pass to me. When that veil was torn, you had immediate access to me, and you're not using it. You want to wear this around like a badge, Melissa? You want to flash it? You don't want to use it? You don't want to come into my presence? God, forgive me. I had to ask myself, where am I on my walk with the Lord? I'm going, to ask, I'm going to invite you and ask you too. Where are you on your journey with the Lord? Are you coming into church on a Sunday morning like Lydia and going through the motions, but you need God to open your heart in a new way? Are you maybe coming to church on a Sunday morning and you're walking down and maybe like Saul, you're just walking on the road to Damascus each week like I did for 27 years? Cursing God? Are you like Mary who's waiting and, and hears the voice of God and recognize him, recognizing him as, you, as your teacher, Rabboni? John 5, 39 and 40 says, You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are which testify of me, but you're not willing to come to me that you would have life. Luke 10, 27 said, so he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength and all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. I read this scripture, all your heart, soul, your strength, your mind, everything, everything within me. I found it interesting. Why does it say heart first? Because I think we can get it up here. We can know all about him. But I think he had to remind us that something had to happen right here. Something had to happen right there. Jesus is waiting. His love is uncontainable. Second Chronicles 16.9 says, For the eyes of the Lord...
The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Every day outside of the word of the God, of the word of God is a missed opportunity for you. This is his living word, testimony after testimony to encourage you to build your faith. But I don't know about you. Sometimes I'll just let it collect dust. And one day goes by and two days go by and three days go by. I wasn't going to share this story, but I just read this book by Luis Palau. He's a great evangelist in Latin America. And his, he was an interpreter for Billy Graham for many years. And I read a story about his mother. They were living in Latin America, and there was a missionary that knocked on the door. She answered the door, and the missionary comes in, and the missionary hands her a Bible, talks to her, and leaves. They were going to church at the time. And she starts reading the Bible and she gets into the Beatitudes. She understands the holiness of God. And Luis Palau says, he, he sees, like, she takes a knee and says, this is so holy, I can't even stand. I need to kneel to read the word of God. And he said, almost every day since then, since that moment, she read on her knees but yet I can let it collect dust and not get in it. When he's got something to tell me, the Holy Spirit wants to speak to me through his word. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, if you seek me, you'll find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Not some, all. Of your heart. You'll find me when you seek me with all of your heart. I want to share something with you as I was praying over this message and preparing for this message. Um, I wake up a lot in the middle of the night and I, I hear the Lord speak a lot in the middle of the night. My husband will often say it's because you're not using your 20,000 words right now because <laughs> you're sleeping. And I'll wake up and the Holy Spirit will give me a word. And I was praying about this message. And I woke up. This has never happened to me before. I physically was in tears. My pillow was flooded. It was wet. And I was like, what? Is it raining? Like, is there water coming? What is this? Like, I was out of a deep sleep. Coming awake, my pillow is soaked. And I had a burden I didn't even know what it was. And I said, God, what do you want your people to know? And I felt like the Holy Spirit said, I'm tired of playing hide and seek. This punky little kid said, what? That's for two-year-olds. God, I'm giving messages to adults. What do you want your people to know? And God said, I'm tired of playing hide and seek. And I sat there and I thought, what in the world? And I said, Lord, what does this mean? What does this mean? And he said, tell me when the first game of hide and seek was. Isn't that good? Doesn't God just ask us questions sometimes? He's good at asking questions. And he said, tell me when the first game of hide and seek was. I kid you not, two in the morning laying on a wet, soggy pillow, I gasped. <gasps> Genesis. Genesis. I opened my Bible at two in the morning, flipping my light on. Genesis 3. Genesis 3, verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves covering. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and he said to him, where are you? 
Adam responded, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Where are you? Are you in a posture, in a position to hear God? Because he's asking us, where are we? Where are we? I'm going to conclude with this. We, the worship team can come up and we'll pray. And I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond. And here's why. I went to church off and on, 26, 27 years old. And I sat in a church and they never gave me an opportunity to respond. And if we hear a word of God, you don't just need another word from me. And you need an encounter with the living God. I'm just here today just to be a vessel to just hopefully introduce you even further still. You have an incredible pastor here that preaches the truth, taking you further each and every week into the things of God. But you have to respond. I had to respond. I can't do it for you. I just, my heart is that you would know him so much more. And I'm sorry that I'm up here and all I can do is cry. The Lord doesn't let me give these messages and not cry because it's so real to me. In Acts 2, the disciples were out and about and they're preaching and it says, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. And now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? What do I do? Where do I go? I know that he's Jesus and I know he's king and I know he's the Christ. What do I do? You don't have to have all the answers because he does. All you have to do is respond. All you have to do is be a willing vessel. All you have to do is say, here I am. Like I did. Lord, I don't even know you, but I I just promised to serve you. I don't even know what this is going to look like. He does. He does. Would you bow your heads with me? and merciful heavenly father the lover of our souls God how you desire us to walk fully with you not half in with the ways of the world half in with you on a Sunday morning and half out the rest of the week God, you want every part of us. You want us to love you with our heart and our soul and our strength and our mind. God, you're waiting for us to encounter you over and over and over again. You're waiting, God, to put that that fire within us. The revival. Oh, thank God. Thank you, Lord, that you are a restorer and a rebuilder and a rewarder of those who seek you. Jesus, you're so, God, you're too good that we can't even articulate with human words. And so, God, you're speaking to each one individually, and I know and I trust, God, that you're meeting them right where they are. And you're welcoming them, and you're giving them an invitation, Lord, to come forward to sit in the same seat that they sat in yesterday or weeks gone by but new manna, fresh manna for today, not living off of yesterday's word but new and fresh for them today oh Holy Spirit saturate this place in every heart and mind and soul and I'm going to give you all an invitation to come up here in a moment but I'm also giving you an invitation if there's anybody here 
that maybe has, maybe it's your first time in church. Maybe you've sat in church for a long time. I came in church service after church service after church service, hearing a word and walking out the door the same way that I walked in because my heart never fully opened to him. But God relentlessly pursued. Thank you, Jesus. I want to give you an opportunity if there's anybody here that has never given their life to Christ or never fully surrendered. If there's anybody here, I want to, I want to personally help lead you to the one that will change the rest of your life. Is there anybody here this morning that would say, it's time, Jesus, it is now time for you to be my Lord and Savior. Would you raise your hand high if there's anybody here? Okay. All believers in this house. So I'm speaking to you right now. If any piece of this message, if there was a conviction within your heart, oh God, God's not a God of condemnation. He, he's so good. He cares. So if you were touched today and you want to make a a holy declaration of God, today's the day. I'm moving forward. I've had a great, I've had an incredible walk with you, but God, I want more. Because that was my heart. After 22 years, I've walked with the Lord. I've read through the Bible multiple times. I've gotten to do ministry. But God, I want more. I want the move of the Holy Spirit. If that's you, you make a declaration and you come to the altar before you and God. We can go ahead and worship. And I encourage you to come forward.